Okay, so in this opportunity, we present uh, Moritz Weber from Sala University, and he will speak about classification of compact matrix quantum groups. So you can start, uh, Moritz. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. So I, I think this is my first time in Argentina, <laughs> at least virtually. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, asking questions, so I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, let me mention that in this talk, I, it's a bit more from the perspective of analysis. So I, I think you're more acquainted with the algebraic situation. So I want to talk, tell you something about the uh, analysis world and also in particular in the so-called free situation. And uh, we will also use some combinatorics. So let me begin with the question. So what, what is a quantum group? So in fact, I think you can approach this question from several perspectives. So for many people, it's basically a Hopf algebra where you add some further structure. And uh, so, I mean, probably you know Nicole's algebras in the world of Hopf algebras. So this is, in this, in this green part, you can, you can somehow uh, see the, the, the world of quantum groups, but there's also some uh, analytic uh, perspective on that. And this comes from uh, compact quantum groups, or a bit more general of uh, locally compact quantum groups. A subclass of this is uh, compact matrix quantum groups, and the subclass is easy quantum groups. So I, I will speak about the latter two. They have some links with Hopf algebras. Uh, they are not necessarily Hopf algebras themselves, but they are closely linked to Hopf algebras. And I will uh, speak about this link uh, in, a, in a minute. And um, in particular, we will be interested in uh, the uh, several approaches to quantum groups. Namely, we can either go by a deformation, which means you have certain commutativity rules like x, y equals y, x. And in the deformation business, uh, you would like to insert a scalar. So I think this is what uh, many people in algebra are familiar with when they think of uh, quantum groups. But uh, you could also think of uh, a liberation procedure. In this liberation procedure, you take these commutativity relations and you just throw them away. So you forget about them. And in, those, in, in a way, this makes your algebra more free. So in both cases, the deformation and also the liberation, the uh, algebras you consider will be non-commutative uh, in the end. But uh, in the first case, the algebras, usually the size of the algebra stays the same, whereas in the liberation, it really becomes a huge algebra. It's free. And in my talk, I will, I will stick to this uh, liberation procedure and tell you a bit about this. Uh, also, uh, I will first tell you a bit about uh, compact matrix quantum groups, and then we come to uh, easy quantum groups. Easy quantum groups are a subclass of uh, these compact matrix quantum groups, and they have a very nice combinatorics, and they are very admissible for this liberation procedure. It's very clear in this picture what, what this will be. So this is somewhat the vague outline or the vague context of this talk. So I'm approaching quantum groups from an analytic perspective. Uh, and uh, I, I will also reveal some links with top algebras in, throughout the talk. So let me first uh, give you a very uh, dry definition of what a quantum group is in our setting. And uh, so, as I said, I'm sticking to compact matrix quantum groups, so I don't give you the most general definition of quantum groups in the analytic setting, but I'm sticking to a slightly more um, approachable uh, subclass, namely compact matrix quantum groups. So in this class, uh, a quantum group is uh, given by a C-star algebra, a unital C-star algebra A, which is generated by certain elements Uij. And if you plug in all these Uij's into an n by n matrix, then this matrix should be invertible as well as the adjoints of these elements, and there should be a star homomorphism delta. So if you're not really familiar with C star algebras, don't, don't, uh, you should not bother too much. So, so I, will, I will zoom to this mini slide on the, on the lower part, where I give a definition of a C star algebra, just that you see what a C star algebra is, but uh, you don't really have to, to know what it is, in fact. So yeah, I'm, I'm zooming now. So here's, uh, here's the definition by Gelf van Neimark from the 40s. A C-star algebra is an algebra over the complex numbers 
which may or may not be unital. So for us, it will always be unital. So we have a unit and it has an involution. So the involution is an anti-linear map uh, from A to A, such that AB star equals B star A star. And if you apply it twice, you get back uh, the element. So this is uh, an involution and it also has a norm satisfying certain uh, conditions that we wrote here and it is complete with respect to this norm. So you can say in, in, the, in the upper part, this is somehow algebra, right? So here uh, you have an algebra, you have the unit and you have this involution and in the lower part, there's really the analysis happening. happening. So, so this is a bit different from uh, what you might usually use and uh, this is a very important condition here that's called the C star norm condition. Uh, it looks technical, but when you work with it, this is really powerful and this is very important if you work with C star algebras. So let me quickly give two examples. Namely, uh, we can take a look at the algebra of functions, continuous functions, where X is a compact space. So if you take a compact space, then you can take a look at the algebras from this compact space to the uh, complex numbers. And uh, this is forms an algebra um, according to this definition above. So you have pointwise multiplication. The involution is just complex conjugation pointwise. And the norm is the supremum norm. And you can check that it's complete with respect to this norm. So this would be an example. Or another example would be the n by n matrices. Uh, the scalar valued n by n matrices. Um, this is also an important example. Here again, you have some uh, multiplication, namely that's composition or matrix multiplication if you want. You have an involution that's just uh, taking the transpose and the complex conjugate of all the entries. And you have a matrix norm. And uh, well, it's complete because it's finite dimensional. So these are, uh, these are C star algebras. So if you step back and take a look more from the algebraic perspective, think of this complex algebra, think of an involution, and then of some nice uh, norm closure. So that would be our working definition for the day. And if you, if you have these uh, C star algebras, uh, now we want that they are generated by certain elements uh, uij. So this means uh, I'm uh, asking that you somehow take the, um, a algebra which is generated by this uij and then also some, some norm closure. So this is the first condition. And if you plug them in into these matrices, they should be invertible. And then you get this uh, homomorphism that I just mentioned. So this will be our technical uh, definition, but uh, maybe we should not care too much about the precise definition, but take a look at some fundamental theorems. So here's one by Voronovich. Uh, it says, if you take such a compact matrix quantum group, then it, it, it is uh, commutative if and only if uh, you find a compact matrix group such that your algebra is isomorphic to the continuous functions here. So uh, I will say something about the proof and uh, while telling you something about the proof, we will also see why it's really a fundamental theorem. But already now you can see that some of the classical situation, namely the one of uh, these compact groups, uh, this is part of this compact matrix quantum groups. So you see that uh, the classical situation is contained in the theory of compact matrix quantum group. And uh, the classical situation, so the situation of actual groups, this corresponds to, to the commutative situation. Okay, so this is really the highlight of this theorem telling us that the commutative algebras, this is the classical world, the classical world are these matrix groups. And if my algebra in the above definition is non-commutative, I really have something quantum. So let me take a, a look at the proof. So again, I'm, I'm zooming now. So here's the proof. Let's take a look at the direction from right to left. So let's take a compact group and uh, let's define A as the continuous functions on that group. So we have already seen in this uh, small example that this is a C star algebra. Okay, so this is a C, oops, take a thinner line. So this is a C star algebra. 
and we define the elements uij as the evaluation of this matrix. Okay, so G consists of n by n matrices. So if I have such a matrix, I can ask what is its ij-th entry? And this shall be the definition of, of uij, right? Oops. So this shall be our definition of the uij, and uij star is just a complex conjugate. And then we can check that the definition is satisfied. So this is a C-star algebra, which in fact is generated by these elements uij. For this, you need the stone weierstrass theorem. So you might know this Weierstrass approximation theorem. Usually it tells us if you take continuous functions, they can be approximate by polynomials. Okay, so this is a very classical theorem by Weierstrass. If you take all the polynomials and you take a good closure, then you will get the continuous functions. And you can do exactly this uh, theorem in a slightly more abstract form, and then you get this result here that A is really uh, generated by this uij, so A is equal to uh, the C star algebra generated by the uij. So this was our, our first point in the definition, so that, that's okay. Then our second point, let's take all these functions uij and plug them into a matrix. Well, then this matrix is invertible in the n by n matrices over Cg. Why is this? Well, let's plug in a matrix G in this U, and what comes out is exactly the matrix G, right? I mean, I, here, here I, I start with a GLNC, and this tells us that uh, in the end, our matrix is invertible, right? So I start with an invertible matrix, and if I take the evaluation functions and put them together back to the matrix, then this must be invertible. Okay, so this was our second item on the list. And then the third item was that we have a certain uh, star homomorphism. So this is basically matrix multiplication. I mean, look at this formula. It basically tells us that if you take the evaluation of the matrix, it behaves as matrix multiplication. So maybe let me not really prove uh, it in, in, in detail that this is exactly what, what we wanted. So it's a star homomorphism in this uh, category of C star algebras. But you see, you have the matrix multiplication on GL and C, and it uh, gives you a formula which, which really looks like this. So this is a compact matrix quantum group, and it is commutative. So this is uh, one direction. And uh, this tells us that this, this fundamental theorem uh, is, is a good one, because here you see uh, compact matrix quantum groups generalize groups. right? So that's just what I said. When you take any compact matrix group, uh, G and G, L, and C, then this will give rise to a compact matrix quantum group in, in the way that, that we just uh, convinced ourselves here. So this means compact matrix quantum group, they contain the classical case as uh, the commutative part. Let, let me now tell you something about the, the converse direction. So for the converse direction, uh, we use the fundamental theorem in C-star algebras. So this is a theorem from Gelb van Neumark from the 40s. When you take a unital C-star algebra and it, if, it's, if it is commutative, then there is a compact space such that A is isomorphic to this functions on the compact space. So in our situation, this means we get a compact space uh, G and it is uh, given as evaluation functions again. So some algebra homomorphisms from the algebra to the complex numbers. And uh, then if I, if I, uh, if I define this uh, map Xi as Xi of X applied to Phi, then this will be an isomorphism. And uh, this will be exactly this isomorphism in this fundamental theorem. So if you've never seen this fundamental theorem, if you've never seen this before, then maybe don't worry too much about it. But if you've seen it before, this really gives you uh, the candidate for the compact group in the theorem we want to prove. But for the moment, it is just a compact space, but then it becomes a group with the help of delta. So again, some, some technicalities here, but uh, using this delta, you can eventually uh, prove that your space is actually a group. So this fundamental theorem in C-star algebras, in fact, this is, this is really very important in, in this whole non-commutative uh, business because it, it gives you the roadmap, right? It means uh, commutative uh, is equivalent to, to classic, and uh, this is true for, for C-star algebras. 
the commutative C-star algebras are classic topological spaces. So in this way, you can say non-commutative C-star algebras is non-commutative topology. And in our fundamental theorem uh, of compact quantum groups, you see commutative corresponds to the classical world. So again, uh, non-commutative situation is the quantum situation. And this correspondence goes on, for instance, if you take cons non-commutative geometry, it means you have classical manifolds modeled by commutative algebras. If you take non-commutative algebras, then you will get non-commutative manifolds or quantum manifolds. And there's also a quantum version of information theory or uh, of uh, complex analysis or of probability theory, measure theory, and they all have their counterpart. Uh, not all of them, but most, many of them are in this gelfand Neimark philosophy. So if the algebra is commutative, classical, otherwise it's quantum. So this would be all I wanted to say about this uh, fundamental theorem of compact matrix quantum groups. And it really tells us that we're in the right setting when we want to quantize compact matrix groups. There's another very important theorem. Um, so I, I hope you can see the lower bar. Uh, so, in, okay, it's fine. So uh, here uh, it tells us that we always have a dense Hopf algebra inside our compact matrix quantum group. So this is probably the, the, the link for you. So in this definition of Voronovich, you've already seen this, this map delta here. Uh, so you, you have a, something which looks like a co-multiplication, uh, but in fact, this uh, algebra A itself is not a Hopf algebra in general, but it contains a dense Hopf algebra. Okay, so it's pretty close to the algebraic situation. So there is a dense Hopf algebra and this co-multiplication co above uh, restricts uh, to this dense Hopf algebra. And there's also an antipode and a co-unit so what, what you usually want to have for a Hopf algebra. Moritz, uh, a question. May I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, a is a multiplier Hopf algebra? You said it, it is not the Hopf algebra. It's, it's multi, a multiplier one? Yes. It is, uh, let me see whether it's always a multiplier Hopf algebra. Um, I think that's probably true, yeah. So I, I, I know for sure that it's not a Hopf algebra itself, but whether it's always a multiplier Hopf algebra, I would need to double check. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let me, let me say a word about the, the proof here. So the proof here goes by another theorem of uh, Voronovich from the 80s. Namely, uh, in every compact matrix quantum group, you have a Haar state. So look at the classical situation, you have compact groups then you always have a R measure. And with respect to this R measure, you can do some R integration. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So this R state is basically R integration and satisfies this formula here. And using this R state, we can uh, show something about the representation theory, namely that, uh, that every representation can be decomposed into a direct sum of irreducibles. So we can define our A0 I should take the thinner line. Uh, we take A0 as the matrix elements of uh, such representations. And this will be, in fact, a uh, Hopf algebra. And we can prove that it's dense by using uh, this, this fact uh, up here. OK, so using this, this fact, we can prove that it's really dense. So, so this, is the, this is the link. So in a way, the formula is compact matrix quantum groups um, are Hopf algebras which have an involution and which have an integral. So this integral is, is something like, like H of, of this form above. So you need to have a linear map from the algebra to the complex numbers, which preserves some positivity and which satisfies this uh, equation above. And if you have something like this, then you can do completion and you will get a compact matrix quantum group. And if you then do this dense, construction that I just presented here, you will get back the algebra. Okay, so in, in a way, if you're, if you're not an analyst, um, if you prefer algebra, you can think of compact matrix quantum groups as these Hopf algebras, plus an involution, plus this integration. So this is this fundamental theorem, which somewhat links what I'm telling you uh, with 
yeah, maybe the, the world that you're more familiar with, namely with Hopf algebras. And I think it's time for an example. So let us take a look at a concrete example. So here's the symmetric quantum group as defined by Shuzu Wang in the 90s. If you uh, define a C star algebra uh, like this, so A of Sn is defined as the universal C star algebras generated by these relations. Uij is an idempotent, Uij is Hermitian, and the sum over the Uik's in a row or in a column, this sums up to one. So this is just an abstract definition. You can check that it satisfies the axioms that I presented. So this gives rise to a compact matrix quantum group. But why is it interesting and why does it uh, deserve the name symmetric quantum group? Well, let's take a look at permutation matrices. So let's just take the permutation matrices we know and uh, check whether these relations hold true. So let's take the entries of a, of a permutation matrix. What is the entry? It's either zero or one which means the entry times uh, itself is uh, the, the entry again, right? So it's idempotent, and also it's the same as its complex conjugate. So uh, this first condition here, this is, this is okay for the entries of a permutation matrix. And how about the other equations? Well, that's also okay, because if you sum all the elements in a row, then there are many zeros, but only one unit. And so hence the, the sum of the row, of the entries of the row will be uh, one. Same for the columns. Okay, so 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 this is this is okay for uh, permutation matrices. And uh, in a way, you can you can view this uh, algebra that I wrote there as a matrix valued solution of uh, these equations characterizing permutation matrices. So let me say this again. Uh, let's let's. Take, let's go the other way around. So let's just write down these relations uh, here and uh, ask for solutions. If you ask for solutions in the complex numbers, then you will get exactly permutation matrices, but you could also ask for matrix valued solutions, and then you basically get these quantum permutation matrices. So maybe let us take a look at an even more concrete example. So here you see a permutation matrix, it has entry zero and one, so that's a permutation matrix as you know, and uh, besides, you see this larger matrix, and uh, it satisfies these uh, conditions that we have up there. So now this is two by two matrices as our entries, and uh, all these entries, they are idempotent, they are Hermitian, these matrices, and you see, if I, if I, if I sum up uh, the, 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 the matrices in a row, then this will give exactly the, the, uh, um, the unit, right? So uh, all these conditions up there are, are satisfied. And here you also see what, what is so quantum about this matrix. So what does the first matrix on, on, on the left, what does it do uh, to the first particle? Well, it moves it to the third particle, right? To the third position. So it takes the first particle, moves it to the third. What does this quantum permutation matrix do? Well, it takes the first particle and moves it a little bit to the third position and a little bit to the fourth position. Right? So that's, that's pretty quantum, isn't it? So this is maybe how, how you can think of these quantum permutation matrices. I'm not telling the complete truth here when I say that this is um, the elements of, a, of this quantum group. It's slightly more complicated because we're dealing with this algebra, but as an um, intuition, it's, it's uh, good enough for our situation. So there's also a quantization of the uh, orthogonal group. So you can again write down the relations that, that characterize um, the orthogonal group. So the group of complex valued or real valued n by n matrices which are orthogonal. And you see that, that that's exactly this, as these relations that I wrote here. Or in other words, if you take these relations and you ask for complex valued solutions, then, okay, the, the first uh, equality will tell me that it's real, and then the other two equalities, they will tell me that the matrix is orthogonal. Okay, so this is de in defining algebraic relation where the solutions give um, the orthogonal group. So now if I allow uh, solutions in, in the n by n matrices, I somehow get this quantum group. Okay, so I, in, in blue is always in these blue boxes, this is the punchlines uh, of, of the, 
the current thought. So this, the punchline for, for now is uh, if you take algebraic relations and if you ask for, for solutions in, in C, then you will get the groups. If you ask for solutions in MN of C, you get quantum groups. So again, uh, this is not the, the full truth because uh, we're, we're dealing with C-star algebras and bounded operators. So it might be that uh, we also have some solutions which are infinitely large matrices. So when we really work with these objects, we, we need to be a bit careful here. But uh, just as an intuition, I think this is good enough. Uh, take algebraic relations, solutions in C, you get the classical case, the group, solutions in MNC for the entries, you get the quantum group. Okay, so this is our running example, the symmetric quantum group. This is permutation matrices where all the entries are matrices themselves. And the orthogonal quantum group, this is an orthogonal matrix where the entries are uh, some, some matrices again. Okay, we have matrices of matrices. Let me summarize a number of aspects. So people have studied these objects uh, a lot. So we've just seen we have these quantum versions of uh, the permutation group, the orthogonal group, or also of the unitary group. We can, we can define that. So in a way, in the quantum world, we have more ways of permuting, of quantum permuting endpoints than in the classical world, or we can do more quantum rotations uh, than in the classical world, if my n is large enough. Um, there are also nice operator algebras that are associated to these objects, namely the so-called reduced Cesar algebras or the von Neumann algebras. And they are very interesting. And a number of people like Theo Banica, Stefan Vaz, Roland Venu, Mike Brennan, and Amory Frelon, they studied this, and many others. So, so, so I mean, here, I, I should really emphasize this dot, dot, dots. And uh, these objects, they also yield good quantum symmetries if you're in this business um, of quantum versions of theories. So as I said, there's probability theory, and then there's some quantum version of it, namely free probability. And you can ask, what are symmetries in probability? Well, that's groups. What are quantum symmetries in quantum probability or free probability? Well, that's quantum groups. And uh, you, can, you can do the same with, with uh, Kahn's non-commutative geometry. You have these classical manifolds, classical symmetries are classical groups. Then with Kahn, you have quantum manifolds, the quantum symmetries are given by quantum groups. Okay, so it's the right setting. So these things have been studied, for instance, by uh, Klaus Köstler, Roland Speicher, Steve Curran, Theo Banika, or Debashish Koswami. Uh, so again, many, many people are missing here on my list. Apologies to everyone who didn't make it to this very incomplete and very selective list. Then you can also uh, consider this, this Hopf algebra associate, associated to SN plus, and this will be a Calabi-Yau algebra of dimension three. This is Julien Bichon, Uwe Franz, and uh, uh, Malte Gerhold who, who did this. You can ask for a Hochschild cohomology or Betty numbers. So all these things have been uh, studied for these objects, and you see there's, there's a rich theory around uh, these objects, and it's uh, evolving pretty quickly. So these are some aspects for the moment. And uh, if you were somewhat uh, bored by too much analysis in the talk, uh, you can now take a restart and we can come to the combinatorial part. But maybe let me ask at, at this point, is there any, any question for the moment regarding this first part of the talk? Okay, people are somewhat happy or uh, snoring. <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, this, as I said, we can now take it uh, as, a, as a restart of the talk. So now comes the second talk, and this is the combinatorics behind this classification of compact matrix quantum groups. And uh, this is the, the beginning of these easy quantum groups that I just mentioned in the beginning. So let us take a look at these objects now. So let us start with Schuerweil duality, or also known as tanaka krein duality. So the, the very classic one, uh, you take the unitary group, and then people found out, namely Schuerweil, that the representation theory of this group can be described by the, by the permutation group. Okay, so here's a duality, the duality between the unitary group and the permutation group in terms of representation categories. And, uh, but it turns out that 
for the representation category, you, you should really think of a category rather than of a group. And uh, it's more a coincidence that in, for the unitary group, it gives a, a group on the categorial side. So maybe let us describe the, the symmetric group or the permutations by diagrams. So, so uh, you, can, you can just say, I have a number of upper points, a number of lower points, and I have strings connecting the upper and the lower points uh, according to some permutation. Okay, so that's a reasonable diagrammatic description of a permutation. And the nice thing is that generalizing these diagrams, you can also cover a number of other groups and categories that are in this duality, in this Chauvel duality or Tanaka Krein. Namely, if you take the orthogonal group, then Brauer showed, showed already in the 30s that the representation category is given by Brauer diagrams or pair partitions. So this means now on the, on the diagram side, uh, I'm still connecting two points with each other, like uh, with uh, permutations, but I, I'm also allowed to connect points on the same line. Okay, so I'm, I'm also to do, allowed to, to, to do this move here. I'm connecting two points which lie on the same line. So if I allow these diagrams, then I get the representation theory of uh, ON. If you want to have the symmetric group, then the diagrammatic uh, description is all partitions of sets. I mean, these diagrams on the right-hand side here, these are partitions of sets. Namely, you just take a number of finite points and then you cluster the points into certain uh, subsets and you can express this diagrammatically. So, so this is these partitions of sets here on the right-hand side. So now for SN, you're, you're allowed to connect any points with any other points and you're it doesn't restrict to only connecting two points. You can also connect five points or three points, or you can also have guys which are very lonely. Then uh, Voronovich showed in the in the eighties that uh, so uh, so is my reference Voronovich uh, coming up. So he showed some uh, quantum version of this Tanaka Krein. So we had this this S N plus and we had this O N plus. And they can also just be described by diagrams. Uh, I mean, okay, strictly speaking, Voronovich only uh, explained that there must be some representation category of a certain kind, but then later uh, uh, it was found out that you can also describe this by diagrams. So this was mainly uh, Theo Banica doing this. And here, uh, the diagrams on the right-hand side, they are non-crossing. So this means uh, I'm not allowed to draw strings which are crossing. So um, I, I don't want to spoil uh, the, the, the punchline for the moment, but uh, you, can, you can think of the upper part as the group part and the lower part as the quantum part. And here you see that the diagrammatics is going by non-crossing or planar diagrams. Okay, so this is the main feature by passing from the groups to the quantum groups, you have to uh, reduce the crossings. So this is what we what we also call the, the somewhat the, the free world, um, that we just get rid of these crossings. So what what does this have to do with the so what, what, what does this planarness of the diagrams have got to do with non-commutativity for the generators? So how does this translate to the to the algebraic relations? And uh, this is what I want to explain next. Namely, here's my my definition. Um, so let me first tell you about the definition and then explain this, this link with the, with the algebraic relations. Namely, uh, there's a definition of a category of partitions. So this is a set uh, C, which is closed under certain operations on these partitions of sets. Namely, the first one, you can just uh, put diagrams side by side. So you take uh, two of these uh, partitions, you put them side by side and you get a new partition. This is called the tensor product of the partitions. And then you can compose the diagrams. So you write one diagram on top of the other and you just follow the lines and you will get a new partition, right? So for instance, uh, let me see. So here, here you take this point for instance and then you, then you follow the lines and it, it goes like this and it ends up at this uh, lower point here, okay? So this means that uh, in, my, in my final partition, this left upper point and this left lower point are connected by a string. And uh, then I have an involution, which means I just flip the partition. Upper row becomes lower row, and lower row becomes upper row. 
And then I also want uh, that certain key partitions are in my category. So this is a very com combinatorial thing, right? So I take these set partitions, I take a set of set partitions, which is closed under all these operations, and then I call it a category of partitions. So this is just a fun object from, from combinatorics that I want to study here. And uh, we can take a look at a number of examples before I tell you the link to quantum groups. So uh, all partitions, they are of course closed under these operations. I mean, if you take the set of everything, then this will be closed under the operations. But also pair partitions are closed under this. So check if you take partitions where only two points are connected and you put them side by side, you'll get a new one. And again, it's always only two points that are connected, right? For the composition, you might have to think a, a minute to, to realize that it's again only pair partitions uh, coming out. But I guess for the involution, again, it's very, very clear, right? If you only connect two points uh, in your picture and you flip the picture, then uh, it still just connects two points uh, with each other. Then there are non-crossing partitions. So here, as I said, the lines are not allowed to cross. And again, you can check that it goes through all of these operations the same for non-crossing pairs, or here's a slightly more exotic example. If you take non-crossing partitions where all blocks are of size one or two. So again, quick check. If you take such guys and you put them side by side with the tensor product, you will see that again of the resulting partition, all blocks are of size one or two. And then you can also check for the composition and the involution that it still holds true. So these are five examples of these categories of partitions. How are they, how are they linked with uh, easy quantum groups? Well, here's the definition. A compact matrix quantum group is called easy if its representation theory, in the sense of Voronovich, Tanaka, Krein, is given by such a category of partitions. So what does it mean? It means that in fact the intertwiner space, so, so this is the intertwiner space, um, is given by, by these um, diagrams. So here I'm telling you span of, of certain maps TP, which are indexed by the category of partition. So what is this morphism space? Well, it's defined as uh, linear maps from C to the N tensor K to C to the N tensor L, which is linear and which intertwines uh, this, this uh, U tensor K and U tensor L. Right, so, so, so here you, you see this intertwining. This is why this is called the intertwiner space. And if this space of linear maps is spanned by certain maps TP, which are indexed by categories of partitions, then we call it easy, okay? So this is the definition. So I, I now have, I have to explain to you what this TP is, and uh, I will tell you some more technical details how this links with uh, the algebraic relations, but, uh, Again, let me, let me uh, quickly save this punchline. According to this definition, easy quantum groups are in some correspondence with categories of partitions, okay? So on the left-hand side, you have certain uh, quantum objects, certain quantum algebraic objects, certain algebras which are endowed with something. And on the right-hand side, you have categories of partitions, so combinatorial, okay? So, so here you have, let's say, algebra or analysis. And here on the right hand side, you just have combinatorics. And this is the, the very important punchline for these easy quantum groups. You only need to employ combinatorics in order to, stand, to understand these, these objects here. Okay, so now let me tell you a, a bit about this, this map TP. So some, some technicalities here. So if we say P is this uh, crossing here, then Here's the definition of the TP. Uh, what does it mean in our concrete situation? Well, let's take TP of EI1 tensor EI2. Then according to this definition, I need to sum over certain J1, J2, such that uh, I have this delta P, I1, I2, J1, J2 and then ej1 tensor ej2. So now I'm uh, spelling out this definition in this particular case. So what does this delta mean? Well, let, let us take these indices of the orthonormal basis of c to the n. 
I1, I2, and J1, J2 in the, in the target uh, space. And let's write this partition in between. And if now these indices match, then my delta is one. If they don't match, then my delta is zero, okay? So I'm summing over all possible indices in my target space, but I'm allowing only those indices that match with my initial indices according to the partition. So in this particular case, if I plug in I1, I2, so the only thing that survives is if J2 is I1 and J1 is I2. So this means I only get out uh, this vector here. So this is exactly the flip map, okay? So you see if, if, I, if I plug in this crossing partition uh, P, then according to this definition, I uh, obtain the flip map. And if my partition is a bit more complicated, then well, the map TP will be a bit more complicated. So then in this definition, we said that TP should intertwine this U tensor K and U tensor L, and this shall be the definition for these easy quantum groups. So how does this relate with the algebraic relations? So that was my question uh, some, some minutes ago. Well, let us check this. Uh, so I take TP U tensor two, EI one tensor EI two. This will be the sum over all K one, K two, TP E K one tensor E K two, tensor U K one I one, U K two I two. So this is basically I apply the matrix U tensor U to the vector EI1, EI2, and I, then, then I get these uh, coefficients of the matrix and uh, also these this vectors. But now I have to apply the, the map TP. So this gives me this uh, map here. I said TP is just the flip. So I get this, uh, this computation here. So now what happens if I, if I do, the, do the other way around? Because I want my, that my TP is an intertwiner. Well, now at first I apply the flip and uh, then I apply the, the U. So this will give uh, EK2, EK1 tensor, UK2, I2, UK1, I1. Uh, okay, so I, I first flipped EI1, EI2 and then I applied my u, so this is what comes out. And comparison of the coefficient, coefficient uh, tells me that uh, these uij commute, okay? So I, I see that this, that this uh, partition, oh, now I draw another circle around it. So if I start with this partition, this crossing partition, it will produce the flip map on TP, and this will produce on the relation side that the UIJ commute. So now punchline crossings correspond to commutativity relations. Okay, so now we're, we're in the business understanding this Schorwald Tanaka Grein diagram from a few slides ago. What, what, what did it mean that when we were from the groups that we passed to the quantum groups by restricting to planar diagrams, to non-crossing diagrams? What, what, why did we choose these non-crossing diagrams? Well, because the crossings in the diagrams, they correspond to certain commutativity relations, okay? So this is uh, how this translates on the, on the very technical level. Maybe at this point, let me tell you a little uh, side remark, namely there's also these Delin categories. So here in, in, the, in the composition diagrams, uh, it might be that certain loops appear and if you take a weight for these loops, then uh, this will be this will, will, will influence uh, my, my TP map. So if I compose these maps TP and TQ, then uh, I will have certain uh, a certain loop factor appearing here. And uh, delineate the idea. So what happens if the weight for these loops? I don't take natural numbers, but I take complex numbers. And then he said, well, well this will then give me a kind of representation theory of symmetric groups where now my 
number of generators of the symmetric group is a complex number. Okay, so this is what Dillin said. He said, let's take the representation theory of Sn of the symmetric group. It is given by diagrams. In the diagram, certain loops appear. Let's do this loop calculus with complex numbers instead of natural numbers. And then we get certain categories which somehow are the representation theory of a group, of the symmetric group on square root of two many generators. So that's a very disturbing thing. He calls these interpolating categories. And in fact, by studying these representation categories for non-integer values, you can learn something about the symmetric group. So that this is Delin categories, which has been extended to other groups. And if you start with categories of partitions, you will get many new interpolating categories. So this is what uh, Johannes Flake and my PhD student Laura Maaßen uh, worked out. So uh, via this diagrammatic calculus, you can also uh, produce new interpolating categories in this Delinear kind. So by the way, I should send regards by Johannes Flake. He told me that he knows uh, the people in Argentina. I think he was there, what did he say, 2009 or something long ago. So those that remember uh, Johannes Flake, uh, his regards go to you. Okay, so now let me come to the, to the last part of the talk, namely the classification of easy quantum groups. So uh, recall, uh, we, we said that easy quantum groups, that's basically the same as categories of partitions. So maybe let me recall the slide on categories of partitions. So here it is. Uh, it said, uh, we need to seek for sets, subsets of PKL, which are closed under tensor products, composition and involution. Okay, so this is the game. If you want to classify easy quantum groups, you need to classify these categories, so these combinatorial objects. And we already had some, some five examples, but uh, the game could be, are there more examples than this? And how many are there? Which are these examples? Okay, so this is the classification game. And uh, let me now tell you something about this classification of these categories of partitions. And uh, let me first give you a flavor of this theory. So let us prove a very simple statement. There are exactly two categories of partitions which are non-crossing and which contain, oops, there's a uh, uh, partition missing. So this lonely guy, so just one point. So the partition consisting of one point. There are exactly two such categories. So in the first case, uh, we have a category which is non-crossing. So all the diagrams now are planar. We have that this, uh, that this um, singleton, how we call it, is in the, in the category, and this three block is not in there. I'm claiming that then the category is one of the guys we already met, namely blocks of size one or two. How comes? Well, let me first assume, for this one direction, let me first assume that uh, some partition which might look like this is in C. So now I, I assume that there is a partition in C whose block is not of size one or two now that the block is, for instance, of size three. So now I can compose it with uh, this uh, partition, this, this identity partition, because this was in my category. I can also compose it with this uh, adjoint of the singleton. So I have the singleton and I can do the flip. So I can also take the tensor product of this one and I can uh, go on composing it with such uh, uh, diagrams. So you see that the lower line here of this composition, these are all partitions which are in my category by definition, and I can, if by flipping and putting them side by side, I get a partition which is certainly in C, and the composition shall also be in C. And I see the outcome is this three block partition, and this is a contradiction because I assumed that this guy is not in there. Okay, I can also take larger blocks and I can see Whenever I take larger blocks, then this will lead to a contradiction. So this is the one direction. And the other direction, if I take, for instance, uh, this partition here, and I'm, I'm composing it in this way, then this will be in, in C. Okay, so I, I only use pair partitions and these blocks of size one. And if I do this, comp this uh, construction here, I get uh, uh, arbitrary partitions with blocks of size one or two, and they are all in C. Yeah? So I'm, I'm only using uh, 
partitions. So I'm only using the pair partition and the singletons and the, this identity partition uh, over here. And uh, with this, I can construct all non-crossing partitions with blocks of size one or two in, inside of C. So this uh, is how I, how I can prove this direction. And for the second case, now I'm, I'm assuming that the singleton is in there, but the three block is also in there. Okay, one direction is, is uh, safe. Um, so I already assumed that C is in the non-crossing partitions, but I can also construct any non-crossing partition in here. Namely, I can, for instance, uh, compose these, these partitions uh, like this, and I, I get arbitrary large blocks and I get arbitrary non-crossing partitions just constructing from the ones I started with. So this means I, I, can, I can just by some combinatorial um, tricks, I can distinguish uh, the case I'm interested in into two cases and then I can determine the categories and I see that this is all. So this means now if, if, I'm, if I'm interested in this, um, this situation where I don't have this guy, uh, then, then it will be get, get more complicated. And this is on the next slide. So here's the list of the classification of easy quantum groups. So this started in two, 2009 with the work of Banika and Speicher, continued with Banika, Curran and Speicher. Then I also did something in 2013. And finally, together with Sven Raum, we classified this class completely. So the first case is uh, if, if we have the, um, this crossing in the, in the category. So there are exactly six categories. So this corresponds to the relation x, y equals y, x on the algebraic level. We've seen this before. So these are then the groups. So there are exactly six easy groups. So here are the categories. And uh, on the right hand side, you see the groups. Then you can, you can ask for the free case. So where, where no such uh, crossing is allowed and all the, the, the diagrams must be planar, then there are exactly seven cases. Then we have something which we call half liberated. So this uh, corresponds to the relation x, y, z equals z, y, x. And uh, there, there's also a number of cases. And then there's a, uh, there's, there's a rest uh, which goes with, with these diagrams here and where you have to use certain quotients of the free group on two generators uh, to the nth power. And then you, then you do some construction, which I, which I won't explain. And then there's also a remaining case where you use some other partitions. So this is just to give you a, a vague impression that uh, there are really many of these orthogonal easy quantum groups. In the group case, there are uh, exactly six. For the free case, there are exactly seven. For the half liberated, uh, you, you see these, these examples that I wrote down there, plus one infinite series. And uh, this lower part, this is uncountable. So this means there's really a huge class uh, of quantum groups which falls into uh, this setting here. So the, the punchline here is it's uh, completely classified and uh, it's huge. So in the remaining few minutes, let me tell you something about the unitary case, namely we didn't cover the unitary group. So here uh, we now have some non-hermitian uh, elements on the algebraic side. So now my elements uij, they are no longer a hermitian. And this means on the diagrammatic side, we need to involve colors. So this is the combinatorics that changes and we defined uh, together with Pierre Tarago, uh, I think it was 2016, uh, that a category of two colored partitions is a set which is again closed under all these operations. You have to adapt it slightly and uh, it, it must contain this partition. So then you can adjust the definition of, a, of two colored partitions. And then we all already have the, have the same definition. So uh, if you take these morphism spaces and now uh, we have to involve certain U's and U bars. So that's not the same anymore. And uh, we get some color string. And um, if you take partitions colored with exact, exactly this string, then this will explain the, uh, the intertwiner space here. So it's slightly more complicated than the orthogonal case, uh, but you can, you can do this uh, using colors. 
And then there's the classification. Um, so together with Pieter Rago, we did some parts. My PhD student, Daniel Kromada, did some part. And my other PhD student, Alexander Mann, did uh, also huge parts. So this is still ongoing. So this is only partially classified. And here, uh, again, we have, we have the group case. Uh, and this is already infinite. So we have many quantum groups here. Then we also have the free side. So there are way more non-crossing ones. So, so again, this is, this is infinite and we have a, we have a huge uh, uh, list here. But uh, also what, what I find pretty exciting is that the half liberated case, so where you have some crossings, but not all crossings, some, some partial commutativity relations, this is really huge. And here we, we use uh, sub semi groups uh, of the natural numbers to uh, index these, these uh, versions. And uh, the combinatorics, they, it, it looks a bit like these tartan buttons. So this is a tartan button uh, in, uh, in the Scottish uh, culture. And our diagrams, they look a little bit like these buttons. So you can call it the tartan classification. And you get many uh, half liberations of, of UN. So there are many, many quantum groups sitting between the uh, group, the unitary group, and the free unitary quantum group. There are many, many, many ways of uh, quantizing this object in between, and they are indexed by these tartan buttons. And uh, for the rest of the classification, we need to use some rules on block sizes, colorings, and crossings, but it's uh, still incomplete. So this is. Uh, uh, research in progress. So here's a little summary going from the orthogonal case uh, that's that's complete and the unitary case is way richer and uh, there are some important cases namely the, the group case, uh, the free case and the half liberated case and uh, for the other cases we're still uh, trying to figure this out and I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you Moritz. Thank you very much. So, are there any questions? When you have a, such a easy quantum group, is it possible, at least in one family of examples, to classify all quotients? I mean, yeah. for instance, if you ask to classify the quotients that have some growth condition, for instance, the finite quotients. Okay, yeah. So, uh, it so, so probably one, one needs to distinguish whether you're only interested in those that come from these diagrams or any quantum groups. So this, this makes a difference because uh, here we, we, we only say those um, quantum groups that are described by these diagrams, we can classify them, but there are also some quantum groups um, in between which, are not, which do not have such an easy description by diagrams, so we call them non-easy. And uh, so this, this is way more complicated and I, there, there is a very small class where we can say we found everything, but for most of them, uh, it's, it's very difficult to find all of them. And uh, relating to your particular question, if, if you're interested in, in some conditions like, like growth or so, um, I, I think if you're, if you're able to formulate this condition in terms of diagrams on some properties of the diagrams, I have some hope to classify it. But if not, uh, I guess for the moment we don't have, have the means. Um, but uh, that sh should not prevent us from trying it, yeah. Hmm. Thank you. So it's very interesting, this uh, easy philosophy. So it really reduces to very combinatorial question. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's, it's very exciting because you can read a lot from the combinatorics. So for instance, with Amory Frelon, we, we described uh, some of the Caribbean envelope of the representation category, uh, purely in terms of these diagrams. Um, 
or you can also yeah ask for for some symmetries in this in this free probability setting and then again you can read a lot from the diagrams so the, the diagrams contains a lot of information about uh, the quantum group and it's interesting to to find this out Nicolas, with, with respect to your question, if you think about quotients, may, maybe you have to interpret the, the category in terms of diagrams. Of, or, I mean, these categories are, are, are made up with diagrams. Uh, I don't know if it's easy to, to understand any category or just to find the diagrams inside. Do you know, Moritz, examples about that? If, I don't know. If, if you get a category, there's a chance to get diagrams from that. Has to do with diagrammatics or categorifications of, or something like that. Yes. Yeah, so in, in fact, I, I think there there are two ways you can you can try. So first, as you said, try to find good diagrams or good combinatorial descriptions for the categories you're interested in. So this is something that my my PhD student Daniel Gromada worked out for some classes. So he took certain diagrams and then, uh, I mean, now this is a bit technical, but passing from the combinatorics to the quantum group, you needed this assignment uh, going from a partition to a map, right? So going from, from this partition to, to this map TP. Mm. And I, I presented one way, and this is a very canonical one, uh, which is also, by the way, used for temporary leap categories, for instance, if you've ever heard of this. But... Uh, there's, there are also other ways of assigning this functor, and this is what uh, what is pretty difficult to find. And my, my PhD student found some other ways of uh, expressing such a functor. And then you still have some combinatorics, but the interpretation on the quantum group level will be different. So you can you can then have some some functorial equivalences of of the categories here, explaining you some some other objects again by certain diagrams. So this is one way to go. Uh, you have you have some combinatorics and you describe it in a different fashion. And by the way, in this uh, setting, I, I should also advertise the, the work by uh, Manchinska and Robertson. So they employed finite graphs as the combinatorics. And uh, with this combinatorics, they could describe a quantum automorphism groups, so, so subgroups of, uh, of this SN plus. Um, so that's that's a, also a very powerful description here. So this is one way to go, taking other combinatorial objects to describe your category. Another way could be to go more abstract and just to work in category theory and say, okay, I, I take certain uh, categories and I uh, check that they satisfy the, the, the properties I need for such a Tanaka crime thing. And this is something that, that uh, uh, also uh, Johannes Flack and uh, and Laura Maas and also my PhD student Alexander Mann that we're trying to, to figure out um, how to go this more abstract way in a categorical sense. Yeah, thank you. More questions? Okay, we thank Moritz again. Thank you very much. So maybe let, let me use this to, just for a minute to advertise some, some event that we will having starting in October. And this is called the Internet Seminar. So it's very analytic, but uh, it's, it's on C-star algebras and dynamics. So, so if, if you want to learn uh, about C-star algebras, you can, you can come to the seminar. There are some online lectures. So we provide certain lecture notes and uh, then people from all over the world. So usually it's, it's really from all five continents or six continents, uh, they, they take part in the seminar and they, they read the, these notes uh, at home with their advisors and then uh, there are some discussions, online discussions and uh, in the end there will be a, a workshop uh, which is in, in Wuppertal. So if, if you're interested in, in this, uh, in learning more about C-star algebras and also some group actions on the C-star algebras, then you can visit the web page and also inscribe to our mailing list. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.